Porterhouse. Yes, sir, Judge. There's a brown Audi parked in my parking space. Yes, sir. Get a tow truck over here and have it hauled away immediately. Right away, Judge. Right away, sir. The bloviating country club fool. We love this guy. He's usually a man in his 60s complaining about some disturbance to the status quo. Or he's planning a regatta. Or playing golf. Yeah. Or telling someone to buy or sell commodity futures. This is an outrage. I demand an investigation. This is, of course, when he's not pulling the strings on something nefarious. How much better can you eat? What can you buy that you can't already afford? The future, Mr. Gitz. The point is that for a long time, we had access to a credible bad guy in movies, someone who we could safely assume was a debauched enemy of decency, bearing little concern for people outside his class. Then something strange happened. This figure receded, and we started seeing a different portrayal of wealth on the screen. The stakes are going up. No mistakes. The end of the 20th century brought with it a recontextualization of money and power and those who boasted. These people weren't the focus of the joke anymore. They were the ones making it. Give them to me young, hungry, and stupid, and in no time, I'll make them rich. After the experimentation and standardization phases of filmmaking's early days, the art form snapped to attention in a big way during the Great Depression, when it gave people a form of escapism they hadn't had before. The release of sitting in a darkened communal room was a real boon to the masses thrown a loop by the market crash of 29, and the worldwide instability auguring the war to come. A filmmaker I always think of is Preston Sturgis, whose heyday was the 1940s. He had access to money while growing up and lived an exciting life between America and France, so naturally he chronicled glamorous rich people in their jet-set lifestyle. His movies are slick stories with attractive people bantering via whip-crack dialogue. Do by the way, my name's Pike. Oh, everybody knows that. Nobody's talking about anything else. This is my father, Colonel Harrington. My name is Gene. It's really Eugenia. Come on. The feeling I get from a Sturgis film is that his characters are doing exactly what you'd be doing too, given the material resources. And for good measure. Sullivan's Travels features a kind-hearted millionaire who dirties himself up to furtively mingle among the hoi polloi on a mission to find the best way to elevate the American spirit. There's a lot to be said for making people laugh. Did you know that's all some people have? It isn't much, but it's better than nothing in this cockeyed caravan. The point Sturgis is making is clear. Millionaires are clever. They have your best interest at heart. And their oversight of vast sums is sensible because they are very smart and well-intended. It's just always been this way. This is great fun. I've never bought things for a girl before. I mean in any such quantities. Later in the 20th century, coincidental with the explosion of the American middle class, we see the filmed picture of wealth changing with who gets to tell the story. And that is why this marijuana, which I am told is particularly pure in form and is what I propose that you indulge in here with me. The boomers were in full force as for post-diaspora, first-generation Jews. A line was drawn after Vietnam and Watergate. Power was not to be trusted. Let me ask you a question. One, a hey, year uh, creep, what are you bothering my chick for? I, no, I'm not bothering her. I just wanted to ask her a question. You're bothering us. Amid all the Chinatowns, Parallax Views, and Serpicos, and their nuanced visions of class and power, my eye always returns to the ingenious creation of Ted Knight, Judge Smales. I want potato You'll chip. get nothing and like it. The authors of Caddyshack knew exactly what they were doing, sending up the gray-haired wasp meanies they remembered from their childhoods. Doug Kenny, Brian Doyle Murray, and Harold Ramis were Midwestern reared comedy nerds, acting naughty and misbehaving in the back of the class. They didn't care whose toes they stepped on, so long as they provoked a response from the boorish. I bring up Caddyshack very intentionally because it was released in 1980, the year America experienced a political sea change. The Reagan era began a momentous eight years in history which, in retrospect, dictated how the nation would proceed far beyond his two terms. There have been times in this office when I wondered how you could do the job if you hadn't been an actor. Reagan was a spokesman for a conservative movement bristling at the excesses and misbehavior of the 1960s. Unbridled, deregulated capitalism had no losers. Unless, of course, you count all the billions of losers all over the globe. Like me, you might have been nurtured on the movies of those eight years, which we now see as a golden age of genre. Since the blockbuster was codified in the waning days of the Ford administration, Hollywood spent the 1980s going all in on the form. Those sacred values from the 70s, 
namely skepticism, paranoia, and righteous indignation. They were replaced with a veneration of material. You're on a roll, kid. Enjoy it while it lasts, because it never does. Once again, the access of who was allowed to make the story shifted, this time to MBAs and CEOs whose only job was to enrich the private companies in Burbank. And look at this. Debauched capitalists were now heroes. Millionaires could be rendered as harmless goofs, man children in bathtubs wearing ludicrous haberdashery. Perhaps you'd like me to come in there and wash your dick for you. Hell, there were even romantic figures who learned humanity from sex workers. <laughs> we weren't watching Jake Giddies be crushed by entrenched power. We were seeing a colossal misread of money equaling personal worth. Hell, kings and princesses were back in vogue in a way not seen in generations. What else was a phenomenon during this epoch? The art of the deal. Not just the concept, but a shitty book ghostwritten for a fraud from Queens. Let's not forget the gross tabloid grabbing antics of Manhattan's premier connoisseur of gold toilets. His message was very much at home in the 80s. Big money had once been the province of landed gentry, but you could deal yourself into the millionaire's game. Just by buying a paperback and following its sexy lessons, you can give a massive fuck you to country club and aristocratic types. Sure, take care to step over the crater from the 1987 crash, but wealth was now attainable. And a miserable and humorless carnival barker was a standard bearer of this new slant on the American dream. But more on him in a moment. Fast forward today and what do you see? The wealth gap between those who have and those who don't has never been larger. John, will you put these in, uh, in Miss Wayne's room? But for every nomad land, there are 35 Hobbs and Shaws. Let's not forget that the MBAs and CEOs who are greenlighting these movies come from the middle, upper middle, and upper classes in America. I don't think that the weatherman from Ithaca is interested in putting his company's massive lens on the problems which might make his C-suite look worse than it already does. So it's not like there aren't withering portrayals of the wealthy coming out of show business, but when they do, they're often misinterpreted. I have been a rich man and I have been a poor man and I choose rich every fucking time. Instead, the brilliant armored billionaire from the movies who saved the universe is a benevolent Elon Musk stand-in, played by a very charismatic actor. No, 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 not, not this one. What are your superpowers again? I'm rich. But you see my point either way. There are enough images of grandfatherly type visionaries or quirky media moguls to change the subject of whether or not wealth centralization is a terrible idea. In the end, Judge Smales appears to have the last laugh. Income inequality is at record levels as a meager few hoard lucre. Gambling is illegal at Bushwood, sir. He's not gambling because the game is fixed in his favor. The image of the wealthy has been sanitized, and more importantly, the poor are rarely shown on screen in any kind of relatable fashion. Visual entertainment in America begins with the middle class and only goes upward, and most images of poverty are elided because they're either a buzzkill or inconvenient, or they're made into such a burlesque that they lose authenticity. You gotta decide, you want to be somebody or not. Smales and his country club cronies run the studios. They run the hedge funds. They run the theater verticals. They run everything. And you know, they even managed to use information warfare to get their guy elected in 2016. And if you need a last bit of sobering proof of the wellspring from which movies can come, always, always read the credits. Finest in men's neckwear since 1982.